The U.S. military is weak, according to an American think tank. Experts break down why that may be and how adversaries are reacting. China targeting U.S. midterm elections. The FBI warning the headquarters of both parties about threats from Chinese hackers. Corruption revealed inside the Chinese Communist Party. Around 500 million party members investigated for corruption in the last decade. Public outcry amid China's pandemic. A teenager dies inside a quarantine center. Distressing videos surface online showing the girl's plight. And U.S. universities dropping in global rankings with China closing the gap. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. U.S. military power is declining. That's the warning coming from a new think tank report. For the first time in nine years, it rated the U.S. military as weak. Here are the details. For the first time ever, the U.S. military is ranked as weak. The determination comes from the Heritage Foundation's newest U.S. military strength index. The index is a report card for how well or poorly the U.S. military has evolved over time. Criteria include modernity, capacity for operations, and readiness to handle assigned missions. The index said that the U.S. military is now at growing risk of not being able to defend America's national interests. It says that the military is needed to deter America's enemies and must be able to physically impose its will on an enemy when necessary. A former lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Navy calls the power comparison between the Chinese and U.S. militaries concerning. We've got fewer than 300 ships in the U.S. Navy. Of those, there are 100 at at sea on any day. Of that 100, about 60 are in the Western Pacific. The Chinese Navy alone is 360 ships. So just in numbers, I mean, even if our ships are far better than theirs, it's still a six to one disadvantage. They're operating uh, within 100 miles or so of their coastline. Our guys and gals are 6,000 miles from home. So they've got a a lot of land-based resources they can bring to a naval fight. We don't have uh, similar sorts of capabilities. So it's just, it's one example of how time and distance and numbers really matter when it comes to forces opposing each other in combat. The Heritage Report says China is the most comprehensive threat facing the United States. The report gives China a score of formidable for its capability, based on its investment in modernizing and expanding its military. The report adds that a few reasons contribute to the U.S. decline. They include years of sustained use, underfunding, poorly defined priorities, and wildly shifting security policies, among others. An expert says the issue with weakness is that all of your adversaries and competitors start coming out of the woodwork. And then, of course, China. If we're not postured with adequate military presence forward, when they do their day-to-day calculations of, is today the day to attack Taiwan and to invade, it becomes more and more likely that they say, yes, that's that day. And it all comes down to having ships, aircraft, and troops proximate to where the flashpoint is. To make the U.S. military strong, he recommends having a clear strategy that works off adversaries' weaknesses, as well as predictability in budgets. Ahead of the midterm elections, a warning from the FBI to both Democrats and Republicans. It's over Chinese hackers searching for vulnerabilities, targeting the computer systems in the party's headquarters. This, according to the Washington Post. What information are they looking for? And what's the big picture? In the first half of our interview, we spoke to Nick Eftimiadis, retired U.S. senior intelligence officer and senior fellow with the Atlantic Council, to find out more. Nick, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. So let's begin with a warning from the FBI to the, both the Democratic and Republican state party headquarters that they could be under attack by Chinese hackers. So what does that mean? How is this playing out? Well, to be frank, this is the same warning that we've seen that we saw 40 years ago uh, you know, in previous elections that uh, China and it, it's, it's likely a collection mission. So when we're dealing with cyber operations, we differentiate between action, destroying systems, or putting bugs, viruses in systems, or just straight collection. So this is likely China's way of trying to monitor which way the elections are going to go, and which candidates you know, have advantages, and how that's going to happen, so that they can better prepare for it, so they can shape the environment 
you know, the international environment for which they're going to have to deal. And Nick, it sounds like this is maybe just one small part of a much bigger picture. So you've written books and articles about Chinese influence operations. So tell us what exactly that means. Well, uh, so if we look at this in two gigantic categories, one would be propaganda. And sometimes that pro propaganda is done quite openly, and China spends billions every year doing this, uh, done through news broadcasting, done through its diplomats, done on Twitter, done you know through thousands of different forms of media, thousands of different sites and media globally. But that's fairly open, right? It's easily attributable to the Chinese government, in many cases admitted. And then there's a whole covert dynamic of this, where China will try and influence political leaders, where they will influence business leaders, where they will covertly influence the Chinese diaspora. So not to vote to, for certain candidates, for example, uh, to assume certain positions on China. And we've seen this actually come to light in a number of cases in the United States, in the UK, in Italy, uh, elsewhere, uh, in Sweden, where they actually work very, very aggressively to try and shape any opinions that can be formed towards China. And so, Nick, what did you find? Like, how far does this go? Is it our government institutions? Where, where are we finding this? All right, let's start with China's application. So there's a United Front Work Department, and under it, eight major directorates and dozens and dozens of organizations under that, and literally hundreds of offices, right? The China Friendship Associations and such. Many of the associations globally, the sister city programs, things like that, are all elements of the United Front Work Department, and they are all geared towards shifting opinion or controlling or directing opinion, foreign opinion on China. Then we have the Ministry of State Security. And we've actually seen the Ministry of State Security conducting covert operations uh, in the case of Christine Fang in the United States, Christine Lee in uh, the UK, and having the, sorry, the Ministry of State Security actually conducting those covert operations to try and influence opinion abroad, typically of political leadership. Uh, and then there are a number of other departments that we've seen, you know, that engage in similar type of work, political liaison department, et cetera, to try and influence opinions towards China. Uh, what, one of the more interesting aspects of China's strategy in this regard is one of encirclement. So they typically don't tend to go for the politician, but all the individuals around that person, you know, the academics that will be supporting that person, the cyber operations to understand who has pro-China views and who doesn't, to business persons, which they will say, look, if you really want to do business in China, you need to go back with this message. So it's a well-orchestrated campaign against specific targets, and we see it at local levels in government and uh, all the way up through national levels of policymakers, and China targeting individuals, think tanks, academicians, um, business persons, around that individual in a strategy of encirclement. In the second half of the interview airing Friday, Nick Eftimiadis gives his take on what steps American policymakers should push for and what concerned citizens can do. An unusual move for the Chinese regime. Officials have delayed the publishing of certain economic data. The decision is causing trouble for global investors and enterprises and adding to what has long been described as a lack of transparency in the Chinese economy. Here's more. The Chinese regime delays the release of wide swaths of economic data as the Communist Party Congress holds session. Some think the party is holding back news of poor economic performance. One missing figure is third quarter gross domestic product data. China's second quarter GDP growth was a lowly 0.4 percent from a year ago. The regime gave no date for when the missing data would be released. The delay is highly unusual and didn't happen during the last party congress in 2017. The withheld data includes industrial production, retail sales, and the urban jobless rate. Trade data and home price data were also delayed. A 16-year-old girl reportedly dead in a Chinese quarantine center after authorities ignored her family's request for medical assistance. Let's zoom in. The incident took place over the weekend in central China's Ruzhou city. The girl's death has led to widespread anger in China, with videos spreading across social media. 
One clip shows the teenager in a quarantine center. She appears to be ill, struggling to breathe and convulsing. The girl died the following day in a hospital. Another video shows a woman claiming to be the girl's aunt. She says her niece died after developing a fever, experiencing convulsions and vomiting, but no medical attention was provided. Thousands of people were reportedly quarantined in Ruzhou City in recent weeks, including six members of the girl's family. The girl's aunt said her niece was not sick when she first arrived. China's stringent zero-COVID-19 policy has led some Chinese citizens to fear forced quarantine, even if they have not contracted the virus. America's universities are dropping again in world ratings, while Chinese universities are climbing the ranks. This is according to Times Higher Education, a major publication that ranks schools worldwide. The U.S. is still ahead. Seven out of the top ten of the world's best list are American universities. And you know them, Harvard, Stanford and MIT, among others. But in the top 100, the U.S. used to boast 43 schools back in 2018. Now that's dropped from 43 to 34. Over the same period, China went from having just two in the top 100 to having seven. NTD's Paul Graney has more. Of course, we know America and China, currently the world's two biggest superpowers. America, pretty far ahead of China in a lot of ways, such as GDP, inventiveness, strength of currency, and the military. But China's catching up fast. In fact, hedge fund superstar Ray Dalio openly believes China will overtake America in the near future. In fact, this could be happening right now in education. So the U.S. has 34 universities in the top 100, while China has only seven. America's is still clearly in the lead, but the Times Higher Education's chief knowledge officer told us there's more to it than just that. China overtook America in the volume of research published, so the sheer number of research papers, the, the scale of research coming out of China has now overtaken America. That's a, a major tipping point that happened in the last two or three years. China has always been behind on the quality of that research. They've been good at producing volume. But overall, the quality has not been as high as America. But what we're really starting to see now is the convergence of the lines, the slight drop for American quality and the increase of Chinese quality. The Times Higher Education puts emphasis on each university's research and its rankings. And it found that not only does China produce more research, a higher percentage of it was among the top 1% of the world's most cited papers. The group tells us that the situation may continue like this. We may find not too far in the future that China not only is overtaking on volume and quantity, they may soon overtake on quality as well, and particularly in key areas of incredible economic and uh, geopolitical importance like artificial intelligence, computing, engineering. So it's a, it's a major shift in the, in the balance of power of the knowledge economy. So why is America's status dropping? Professor Richard Vetter, who formerly worked in college rankings for Forbes, told us a lot of it involves funding. You need money to build the laboratories, to buy the equipment, to pay salaries, etc. We've had uh, massive government involvement, the National Science Foundation, the defense uh, establishment uh, invested uh, heavily, uh, atomic energy uh, uh, research was uh, powerful and important. And of course, health research, National Institutes of Health in the U.S., for example, would be an important example. But in the last 20, 25 years, while we've continued to modestly increase expenditures in these areas, they're going up maybe one or two percent a year in real terms, and some years nothing, zero. Uh, whereas China is increasing its expenditures maybe 10% a year or 15% a year. But Vetter does see another reason behind America's decline, our culture. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for more than a year. Here's what to look out for in our second half. 
Why are American universities dropping in the global ranks? Experts give us an inside look at the changes happening inside U.S. institutions and what other countries are doing to close the gap. Plus, the city of Shanghai is shelling out $200 million for a new quarantine facility. We take a closer look at why. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Apoc TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow. Shen Yun Creations, the streaming platform from Shen Yun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music. Master classes, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. Explore ShenyunCreations.com.